I got the M60 and I start firing, you know. And I was firing everywhere like this, just wiping everything out. But it was him or me. No, no time to think about it. No hesitation at all. Somebody would pop up out of a spider hole and take a shot at you. All of a sudden, you had a sniper shooting at you. Yeah, I've, I've stuck my fingers and thumbs in holes to stop the bleeding. I, I did suffer from a PTSD, you know, and I isolated myself, you know, and I would try, like, self-medications, you know. I was born in Agua Prieta, Sonora, Mexico. I never went to school here in the United States. Never went to school. I probably went for one month, but I was too old to be in first grade and uh, too young to be in, uh, in the, uh, high school. So uh, I never went to school. I had to work. I was born in Pertoville, Arizona. Going to school, we are not allowed to speak Spanish. Most of my friends left school before they got to the eighth grade. You start working at the age of seven or eight out in the fields during the summers, and uh, you learn to adjust. My first four years, I grew up in Mexico. On the 4th of August of 1954, my dad brought my mom, my two younger brothers, and my sister to America. We immigrated through the port of Nogales. I was born in Nogales, Arizona. We went to Sarita for the first two years. Then we moved to Tucson. I started in Tucson at third grade. And I graduated from Pueblo High School in 1965. Arizona's population in 1965 was about one and a half million. Most of them, including the third who were under 18, were inattentive or unaware of the Vietnam War 8,500 miles away. That soon changed. And before it was over, a decade later, more than 600 would die in combat, leaving bereaved families and devastated communities in every corner of the state. Arizona was in transition. I mean, Phoenix was still uh, not nearly the size and population, nor Tucson. Uh, a lot of people were still, you know, they didn't want to move to Phoenix because they didn't want to endure the summers, nor Tucson. So you saw this uh, a little uh, more diverse of a population spread out among the mining towns, Flag, Yuma. And again, Arizona, if you look at just in terms of population-wise, was not a very big state. I think it was much more diverse. Uh, you also saw in percentage-wise more of a Mexican-American population, uh, percentage uh, on a per capita basis, before you saw large numbers of people start moving in from the Midwest and the Northeast uh, that occurred after the creation of air conditioning sort of changed the dynamic in many ways. Douglas at that time was a small town about 12,000 people. I used to go in the bars and shine shoes. And while you're out there, you know, you know, you, you couldn't do no wrong, you know. You couldn't go around stealing from the stores or shoplift or anything like that because it would reflect upon you and, you and your family. But anyway, Douglas was such a small town that if you did something wrong, the word would get to your, to your parents and you would have to, you know, answer for it, you know. I was born and raised in Douglas, Arizona. Went to school here and graduated from Douglas High School in 1967. Back in those days, we had Phelps Dodge going. The smelter was going strong. The railroad was going. It was always something to do on a Saturday, go to the movies, ride our bikes, pick up baseball games. It was, for me, a great place to grow up in Douglas. For myself, Vietnam started uh, when I was in junior high. American Back in 64, 65. In just the last four weeks, they have suffered over 70 dead, 1,000 wounded. You might remember, Vietnam was almost nightly in the news. Tet Offensive started January 31st, 1968. But by that time, there were quite a few guys and some women from Douglas who had already served or were serving in country in Vietnam. And by that time, sadly, about seven or eight of the young men from Douglas had died in Vietnam. 
Arizona's first casualty during the Vietnam War was in March of 1963, an army private from the tiny town of White River. Rural communities were ready suppliers of new soldiers, whether through enlistment or the draft. They're from primarily lower middle class, uh, working class groups, because they didn't have the tools available to them uh, to uh, avoid the draft. But generally, the draft is going to pick up the young men that are not going out to college, that will not have the deferments. They don't know how to manipulate those deferments like so many more affluent, uh, well-educated people do. In many cases in these rural areas, they knew the draft was going to get them, so many of them volunteered. Now, they're also driven by many other factors. It's not just the draft. They're driven by they want to be just like their fathers and serve their country. Many of their fathers served in World War II. They want to be like their uncles. They want to be like uh, many of the people in their communities. A lot of people from Douglas were being uh, drafted, and uh, there are a lot of people volunteer also, and uh, a lot of people went straight to Vietnam after training. I wanted to join the Marine Corps. And back in those days, our recruiter was at the post office. And so I had gone in to see uh, the Marine Corps recruiter. I had Coke bottle glasses. And uh, the recruiter, you know, he says, Dan, you're, we're, we're, we can't take you, you know, because my eyesight was so poor. He says, if you join the Navy and you score well on what we called the basic battery test back in then, aptitude test, you do that, you score well, and you ask to go into Naval Corps School. And he says, I guarantee you, you'll end up with the Marine Corps. He didn't lie. So... All worked out just like he said. First, they take us to Phoenix, and that's where we got inducted. And you raise your right hand, take a physical that works, and then you raise your right hand and take a step forward. And from them, you board a plane and ended up in Fort Worth, California. Take off, run a double, pull out. Right away, they told us we're going to Vietnam. Right away. First thing they did, going to Vietnam. Johnson was a death sentence. It was a senior trip, you know, right out of high school into Vietnam, and it was, it was a death sentence. You were 18 years old, you had to register for the draft. If you were drafted, ended up in Vietnam, it was a death sentence. When I graduated from high school, back in May of 69, just a few days before I graduated, I was told that I had an offer um, baseball scholarship offer to Cochise College. So I took it. I applied for a college deferment and I got it. It was a 4F, which meant the Army was gonna not touch me for four years. Well, soon after I was in college, I got another notice. I was suddenly uh, reclassified 1A, meaning I was eligible for the draft or whatever. It was because more men were needed. So I told my girlfriend that I was gonna join the reserves, which I did. And I was in the reserves for two and a half years. And by that time, 13 men from Douglas had made the ultimate sacrifice in Vietnam. Many joined the Reserves or National Guard as a way to avoid combat in Vietnam and to serve in other ways and in other countries. However, over 5,700 reservists died during the war. Whether drafted or enlisted, after training, their journey to the jungle was relatively swift and lasted a year. We landed in Bien Hoa in South Vietnam, and then uh, we had to go like around twice or three times because they were being uh, bombed at that time. It was kind of scary at the beginning because uh, it was going to be, you know, a year from the first day all the way to the yes, last day, you know, fighting and all that, you know, so it was kind of scary. From Phoenix, I just went, went to uh, uh, Texas. Fort Bliss, Texas, where I was trained for uh, jungle warfare and, and for the basic training and all that. They used to call us traveling guns because they, we would travel, hit and run, hit and run. 
every every so often we would we would stop, make a perimeter, start firing, then we moved, start firing again, and the Viet Cong was constantly after us. Sometimes I w you would sleep 20 minutes, uh, half an hour, maybe an hour. Uh, it was constantly moving. It was like being a fireman. You were on call 24-7. You know, that's all he did was shoot the gun and maintain the gun. You know, he might get up at 4 in the morning, 5 in the morning, shoot the gun, and then maybe go, and then maybe not shoot the whole day, you know. Like one time we shot the gun in Operation uh, Lamar Plains. We shot the gun for about three weeks. You would just sleep by the gun and just shoot the gun. Uh, we have unidentified movement over here. I suggest you bring the patrol up online. What we really encountered were booby traps, and the reason they used a lot of booby traps in that area was because they didn't want us to discover their tunnel complexes in our in their bunker complexes. Um, and sometimes it would be as simple as uh, two small pieces of shiny wire that was sticking out of the ground, that if you went over there very carefully and lifted those wires, the top of a, a bunker would open up. One bunker we had discovered was an underground hospital. They had medical supplies and, and beds and everything set up. Some of the supplies were actually donated to them, the uh, students of Berkeley University in California. Uh, and they were labeled as such to donated to the people in North Vietnam by the student body of Berkeley. We went, we ended up in a temple in Vietnam, and it was a, a Buddhist temple, and there was like uh, 12 uh, dead bodies there, enemies in that temple, and uh, we were being like uh, uh, ambushed by the enemy. And uh, we had to stay there for about, I want to say about six hours. And uh, what happened, uh, those dead bodies, you know, we smelled that, the real bad smell of the bodies. And that smell, it got into me for a long, long time, many years. Injured Marines were taken care of first by Navy corpsmen, carrying medical supplies and armed with a sidearm and an M16. Corpsmen accompanied the Marine units on daily and nightly patrols. Our whole mission during that, that period was um, search and destroy, uh, daily patrols, nighttime ambushes. Usually the squad would leave the compound, you know, daybreak, and uh, there would be anywhere from 12 to 15 men in a squad. And uh, you would you would go on patrol, and there the point man would be up front with a with a stick, probing the ground in front of him. The guy behind him was actually his eyes, because he had his eyes on the ground looking for booby traps. We went into what was called Pipestone Canyon. It was an operation, and um, we went in with 150 men, and. Um, Sixty-six were wounded, not gravely, you know. They were still walking, they got hit and everything. Uh, but of those 66, only six of them were gunshot wounds. They were all booby traps in that particular operation. You were thirsty all the time, and uh, you had a very hard time keeping track of time because you don't know if you had been walking for an hour and a half or three hours. You'd set up your ambush and you would wait. Normally, you would you would just listen. Uh, you would put up with the the bugs that landed on your face and your nose and ears and lips and that because you didn't want to make a rapid move to swat them. You you didn't want to wear any kind of mosquito repellent on an ambush site because the Viet Cong or the NBA could smell you and you heard everything. You would literally hear. Uh, uh, bugs settling in for the night on leaves, uh, big butterflies, moths, shutting down for the, for the night. And it was a corporal's war. I would take my squad out. We were supposed to uh, find, engage, and kill. And that's what we were doing, but we were pretty young. And there wasn't anybody there above the rank of corporal. It was me. Um, 
And it was night after night after night. Security and then a patrol, uh, overnight patrol, or go out and patrol for a week, two weeks, and 30 days, and, and then come back, and then, you know. And then uh, we go on a chopper, uh, chopper flights, whether it be seven, eight, eight choppers, where they take us out, drop us off, and we'd be out there, and then they bring us back in. You depend on each other, you become brothers. You become brothers, become very close. You're all in the same. You're all in the same. You're in the same fight. You depend on each other. You trust each other, or most of them. <laughs> Racial segregation had existed in Arizona since before becoming a state in 1912. The National Civil Rights Act of 1964 was signed into law by President Johnson with prominent Arizona Senator Barry Goldwater voting against its passage. A month earlier, in June, Martin Luther King Jr. had spoken about the act to over 8,000 people at Arizona State University, and King had already given speeches twice in Tucson. I mean, it was a very racial time in our history. Uh, and it carried over into our military as well. And if it was a situation where the blacks had their get together over here, the white has theirs, usually the Indian guys would hang together, Mexican guys would hang together. So it was very, uh, it was prolific. It wasn't just one or two instances. The, the race relationships back then were pretty bad. Many young men coming out of places like Aho and places like one, they'd never seen an African American until they get to boot camp or basic training. Uh, they had not interacted with city boys from Cincinnati or Seattle or LA. And so, you know, it was a transformation. Uh, but just like most everyone else, they knew they had to adjust and adapt and survive. And usually where racism existed most was in the rear areas. Because on the front lines, you really all you cared about was making sure the guy next to you survived so that he could make sure you survived. So the racism a lot of times dissipated in the front lines, but was very present in uh, the rear echelon areas. Well, in one situation, I heard some talking that if you weren't white, you weren't right. And I mean, that was hard. I couldn't believe it. In the front lines, it seemed like there was more minority, more minority. You fight it in the front line. Maybe a lot of us didn't have a college education. A lot of them didn't have maybe a high school education. Maybe they come from families that were underprivileged. That's you know my my way of thinking, but I don't know why. But that's the way in the army in our unit. That's what, the way it was. On May 13, 1975, an Air Force sergeant from Helena was the last of Arizona's Vietnam War fatalities. But there were the many others who returned home with injuries to their bodies and minds. With their tours of duty nearing an end, these survivors with uncertain futures were shipped home to struggle in different kinds of personal battles for years to come. Those with just a few days left were called short for short timers. And I remember they used to call me like nicknames. I said, okay, call me anything you want. But in three days, you call me long distance. <laughs> so, they didn't like that. Because, <laughs> you know, I was short, I was coming home. They just didn't have much of an option to come back and, you know, really uh, just had to go back to work. Uh, some did go to school. Uh, and they had to reintegrate uh, quickly because for the most part, the country didn't care. Um, the best characterization is not the ones that I think of, you know, where you hear about the spitting image that they were spit upon. What I think was actually worse is basically just the, a term that is used by uh, one historian as a collective amnesia, where people just wanted to forget it and put it behind them. So they didn't get parades, rarely. They didn't get honors. They didn't get memorials. They had to build their own in 1980s. I didn't realize how much people in this country didn't support us until I actually got home. 
I just assume that we had the support of the people here. At the time, we were America's best, you know. I, I felt that in my heart then, I feel it in my heart today. When I came in, we were on strike. There, <laughs> there was nothing, the town was dead. But uh, it's okay. I was home, I had my wife and my child to take care of. I didn't worry about it. Back in 69, 70, 15th Street Park is where a lot of these guys used to hang around. And I got to talk to some of them. They were very mellow in their conversations. And I got to the point of once I heard their stories and I told them that I felt guilty. Guilty because I didn't go or I was eligible and I did, chose not to. And they said, no, you made the right decision. First of all, I, I didn't want to get drafted, you know, because I was a little wild in the wild side. And when I went in in the military, then uh, it was so strict and everything. They made me think, hey, this is the real world. You're not a, a teenager anymore, <laughs> you know. Which it, it was so good, you know. I, I think the, the draft was perfect for... For me, probably for a lot of soldiers. I don't think I could sleep at all for eight days. Eight days straight. Did not get any sleep at all. Okay. So what happened, in order for me to uh, get tired or something, I went to work to pick chili, to pick chili, red chili, out in the Frida area. I went to pick up chili, and uh, it was hard work, very hard work. You just picking up chili, green, uh, red chili. And uh, I remember when I was picking up chili, a plane I broke the, uh, you know how the, the sound barrier? When it broke the sound barrier, it just went boom, boom, boom. And I just whoosh, hit the ground. And then, uh, you know, I kind of uh, looked up. I was expecting to see dust, smoke, and you know, like when I was in Vietnam. What did I see? People looking at me, laughing. What are you doing? You're crazy? I said, eight days ago, I was in Vietnam. And uh, I thought I was, we were being hit. I said, I thought we were being, uh, you know, hit, and, and that's why I hit the ground. And honest to God, about. Ten people of the people that were looking at me, they apologized. I would say uh, it matured me faster. It made me, a, I would say, a real man at a young age where I could not vote. I could not consume alcohol. It made me realize how precious life is, not to take life for granted to be thankful, be more charitable, to help those that less fortunate. I think it made me a better person, more religious person. It's not something you can forget, something you don't want to wish on your worst enemy. You cannot forget. I was married uh, to another put it to my first wife, okay? And uh, when I came home, um, I wanted to see, because I had a daughter, and she was born uh, about a month before I left. Uh, and when I, came when I came back, my wife at that time, she was eight months pregnant by somebody else. So I never saw her again. I love being home. I love seeing my, my parents. Uh, you know, when I came out of the service in 71, I only stayed for a while. And then uh, I went to ASU and graduated in 75 and came back to Douglas in 76 to start teaching. The young men and women from Douglas have always stood up and gone. Um, you know, we had some tragic losses, uh, 
I mean, I think six of the, the guys we lost were in my graduating class. I'm a patriot and uh, I'm proud of my military service, just like so many of us are. I'm glad that there are people around that are finally looking at us Vietnam veterans in a different light. And, uh, you know, even though it was an unpopular time, uh, hundreds of thousands of us served. It's a good experience for me to be a Vietnam veteran. And uh, also, looking back, I served, you know, my country. It hurt a lot, uh, but it was a good thing for me to do. I think, uh, and I look back and uh, I'm proud of it. I'm very proud.